Okay, so let's let's get the contextualization out of the way. I know that um, probably almost everybody here is a diehard. I see a lot of I see a lot of merch already. But in case someone has accompanied a friend or just like wandered in unsuspecting off the street, can you guys set up Night Vale in alternating words? N no. <laughs> oh, he's good. The ferret's good. But. <laughs> Uh, welcome to Night Vale. <laughs> is a town in somewhere in the American Southwest where every conspiracy theory is true and people go on with their lives because what else are you going to do? Fantastic. Incidental rhyme or deliberate rhyme? A uh, completely accidental. Okay, leave that to me. Cool. <laughs> and today we are celebrating the new novel, It Devours. Bing, 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 bing. Can you guys describe just a little bit about your process in co-writing? You, you work on all of these projects together, the Night Vale projects. How does that work? And it's not every other word, apparently, because you guys goof that up. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, so when, when we do the podcast, the, uh, when we do the podcast itself, we, we tend to alternate episodes. So one of us will write an episode and then pass it to the other for edits and notes and questions. Uh, and then we just sort of go on from there. And it's, it's, kind of, it's sort of easy with like 2,500 words in a podcast episode, for easily digestible for one person to sort of uh, handle and then move on from there. With a the, with the novel, when you're starting talking like 80,000 words, we, we generally meet uh, a few times to kind of talk through all of our ideas for the novel and start writing them down. And then we start forming a, an outline, uh, like a, just a sort of a rough like one page outline. And then that usually evolves into like a three or four page outline with every single chapter described of like, this is what's going to happen in that chapter. And once we have that, then we're able to divvy up and say, well, I'm gonna do chapters one through four, you have five through eight, um, I'll grab. Um, actually, I had an idea for these ones in the 30s, so I'll go ahead and grab those, and you can just start writing those. I find that profoundly confusing. And that I, I, I'd known that that was partially your process, and I read all your stuff, but I admit that when I was reading it, I'm looking for seams. You know what I mean? I'm trying to figure out where the baton passed between typewriters. Like, is, it, is the voice just so established that it's something that each of you can slip into? Yeah. Yeah, it's different than, I think, each of our individual voices. Yeah. I mean, we've been writing together over seven years now, yeah. right? Yeah, we started in 2010, working yep. on that. Yeah, yeah. so seven years now. Um, and we've been writing Night Vale for almost six years. And so, yeah, it's a thing of... I, I, when I look at early Night Vale episodes, there are genuinely passages where neither of us can remember who, who wrote, wrote it. it? God. Um, and it's a, I don't know, um, that that was a thing that just happened. You know, um, we just found a voice that meshed and are able to slip into that. And I don't have like good tips for that because I think we just sort of got lucky. What is the difference briefly between like each of your solo styles? Because I know that both of you are involved in a lot of solo work as well. Uh, and, the, and the Night Vale style, like what's the daylight between those two approaches? Uh, that's interesting. I, I remember, I, I, we, having been asked that question before, I haven't really honestly given it a, a ton of thought, but like I was thinking about, uh, you know, the uh, one of the things I noticed when we write Night Vale that uh, when, when we pass things back and forth, one of the things that I really appreciate about, colla uh, about collaborating with Joseph is like uh, how, what attentiveness he has towards like plot and continuity. Mm -hmm. Like Joseph's able to sort of like uh, keep more elaborate constructs of, of, of narrative in his head uh, than I am. And uh, I've always sort of gravitated more towards the, uh, the abstract and the surreal. Uh, and so I, I sometimes forget to do things like uh, have a have a reason for something <laughs> happening, <laughs> and uh, and and you know that sort of thing. So you know when when yeah, and in our separate, we started in on these other podcasts writing it, and it's interesting listening to something like Alice Isn't Dead, uh, and hearing sort of a, a more, yeah, woo, you're right. <laughs> I could not agree with you more. And uh, yeah, there, there's there's something about uh, there's something about like the the tightly wound thriller, you know, the the yeah. thing where on the edge of your seat of like uh, not knowing what's happening next, and and then constant uh, surprises at the end of each episode and at the end of each scene. Versus something like when I started working with Janina Matthewson on Within the Wires, uh, these are these more yeah. <laughs> Um, Woo! Yeah, <laughs> uh, we Thanks, did man. we did more like uh, textural and sensual uh, types of experiences of just playing with what the listener can or cannot feel and see based off of mm. these storylines. Uh, in 
I was just going to say, I mean, it, it is a thing, you know, so right now I'm writing an Alice Isn't Dead novel. Uh, <laughs> well, <laughs> wait, wait till I'm done with it first, because <laughs> we'll see. Um, but it is, it is really terrifying to write this book because I have just gotten so used to, um, you know, writing anything with Jeffrey. Like, if I get to a passage and I'm just trying for something and I'm not sure of it, I have the safety net of like, well, Jeffrey will take a look at this and he'll mention if it's not working or he'll fix it. More likely, he'll just go in and fix it. Um, and that is this amazing safety net. And so when you write your own thing, there is this real terrifying thing of just like, I guess I just have to decide for myself if this is good enough, and I don't usually have to do that. <laughs> right. When you know, I, I was thinking about um, like the Lord of the Rings when those when that when the movies came out. You know how the actors all got tattoos? Like they'd been living on set in New Zealand for so long that they were like, that was more their like Middle Earth was realer than Manhattan for them. You know. <laughs> Is it like that? Do you guys have dreams that happen within the Night Vale world? I mean, you've been living in it for a long time now. Is it as real or becoming realer than other parts of your mundane, <laughs> boring, daily Manhattan night lives? I, I, I mean, I don't really like think in terms of the fictional Night Vale world. I, mm. Any dream that I have related to it is like uh, the panicked dream related to like, I forgot to do this thing or yeah. whatever. Like, tour started three weeks ago and yeah. I forgot to show up to a performance. <laughs> or, I've had multiple tour nightmares. I'm <laughs> yeah. sure you have as well. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, um, I do have I do have two Night Vale tattoos though, so I am I am like Elijah Wood in that way. In that way. <laughs> <laughs> um. In, in this novel and uh, in, in the first novel, there's some writing that's done from a female character's perspective. And in doing that, there's also mention of like, um, you know, a first person account of, of what it's like to maneuver through the world in that body. You know, you're, you guys are great at, um, at, at eliciting information from the senses, right? So what it feels like to be stressed out, sweating through your sweater or, you know, feeling the, the, the perspiration on your upper lip. Where, is there any moment of, of anxiety about writing from that perspective? Or do you check with friends or sisters or wives or moms to be like, does this sound right? Yeah, I mean, it's constantly anxious to write anyone different than you. Um, it feels like a, a big responsibility to get it right, but it also feels super necessary um, because we're writing about a town and a town is going to have a lot of different people in it. To be honest about what the world looks like, it can't all look like you. And so we have no choice. It's our responsibility to fill it with people that are different than us and make them full human beings. And, um, and that is absolutely a tricky thing to do. And I'm sure we get it wrong all the time. But, um, you know, I, I think it starts with just listening all of the time and really trying to absorb um, what those experiences are like from the people who have them and then try and reflect that. Um, you know, the basis with any character, I think, that I start with is that um, they're a human being and a human being is going to react to things in a human way um, and they're going to be shaped by how the world treats them but ultimately at heart they're going to react to things like a human being and so if you stay true to a person as a human um, the other details are a little easier to get right. Are there people, are there trusted readers with whom you check, you know, if you're writing something that's from a perspective really different than your own? Do you send, you know, do you send a paragraph or two to someone to say, does this, does this pass muster, or is there anything you'd add? I mean, uh, I have before. I mean, uh, obviously, like uh, I, I've I've passed along stuff to my wife Jillian before, and I know uh, Joseph has with Meg, uh, his wife, and I. Uh, uh, I've definitely passed stuff on to other people uh, to to ask about and, and question about. Like recently, actually, and this is not. Uh, welcome to Nightville, but I've been in within the wires universe lately because of putting out n new shows and uh, <clears throat> have an up upcoming one that uh, we have a, a voice that is uh, for the Montreal Museum of Fine Arts, the curator of the Montreal Museum of Fine Arts, and having conversations with Canadian friends about getting the, uh. getting the exact, like, Quebecois accent right and, like, how to how to do something like that correctly. And, yeah, and so you kind of pass things on to somebody and be like, does this sound right? Is this how somebody might say this? Or somebody who is... Uh, English as a second language, Japanese, like is this, is this how they would write this phrase out? Mm -hmm. um, how would this be said? So I've been having those conversations with other writer friends of mine lately about that sort of thing. So once you kind of hit uh, maybe a wall where you're not entirely certain about how somebody might frame their world, um, I think it's always good to pass something along 
uh, to ask people that. You know, in listening to some of your previous conversations about the characters that you write, um, Joseph, you know, you've talked about the in, the inclusive cast, right? Like we're writing about a whole town. It's our obligation to make sure that there are people uh, who represent the entire spectrum. Is that a is that a moral obligation? Is that an aesthetic obligation? Is that an obligation to which other writers ought uh, be mindful? My I mean, preposition was wrong. Yes to all of that, I think. Um, you know, I, I, I think, yes, there is a moral obligation to reflect the world honestly, which means a diverse world. Um, but I also think that if you don't, um, you're a boring writer. I think that is the bare minimum to not be a boring writer is to reflect the world. Because if you don't, then all you're doing is just regurgitating what you've read. You're regurgitating what you've been told in stories, and you're just turning that around and putting it back out. Um, and that's a boring feedback loop. And the only way out of that boring feedback loop is to try your best, um, and it's never going to be uh, a perfect effort, but just try your best to reflect the world as it is. Um, yeah, uh, I, it's a thing of... I feel it's like it's a bare minimum. Um, I always feel very uncomfortable if anyone's like, it's amazing how diverse your show is because it's like, I, it it doesn't feel like we sh what we're doing should be considered yeah. anything but the bare minimum effort of writing about the world. Um, I got into a discussion with a friend of mine about, we were talking about how much like sports movies, we're both sports fans and how sports movies can be a little annoying because you watch like a, f a football movie and you're like, that's absolutely not how this happens, right? Like every play in a football game is not this like huge explosive hit or whatever. And um, like Rudy is one of the most maddening films to watch. And we're, but I remember we got into, we would have these long conversations about like, oh my God, and at one point in time I'm watching this and there's only 10 players on the field. Like they didn't even actually count the number of players. <laughs> And what was funny is, is that I was having a conversation with him recently, and we were talking about this very issue about like representation in film and television, and like systemic racism in Hollywood, and the idea of like the Oscar so white campaign from a couple of years ago, and that idea of like it really put him off when I started talking about the idea of just looking at the numbers of the percentages of like straight cisgendered white men in television does not match the actual number <laughs> in society. Like when you start talking about like 60 something, 70% of you know, uh, speaking roles being men uh, doesn't actually match that. And I remember he bristled mm. at that very idea. And it's really interesting of like what we choose to say, I really wanna focus on this as something as a writer that I'm gonna fixate on. So is only having 10 men on a football field in a movie scene uh, something that I'm going to spend a lot of time on or is thinking about uh, the uh, racial and gender uh, makeup of, uh, and sexuality makeup of, of my cast, also something I wanna spend some time on. When you're thinking about uh, you know a storyline, like is it, are the characters named right away? And I ask that in part because sometimes as a as a as a reader um, having access only to the finished product, you know I, I get cues about race and race and ethnicity and gender from the pronouns and the names that are being used. Are those things that you decide right away, or do you kind of say we know that this person's going to do this, and then later you kind of assign a name that provides that cue? It depends. I, I feel like I generally name characters when I write them. Um, okay. Uh, you know, uh, an interesting um, uh, exception to that was Alice Isn't Dead um, for that. So I, I, that's, that's a story that is very, I think, claustrophobically personal. You're just entirely in this person's head and it's first person. And so it genuinely was a thing. You know, uh, it got to be about the third or fourth episode and people were like, this mysterious unnamed narrator. I just had forgotten she had never said her name um, because cause you don't think your own name. You wouldn't narrate your own name, and it, so it just never came up, and it never occurred to me to have a name, because um, it's just, I, I was writing from her point of view. Um, so that's actually a, a point where I went to Jessica, who plays um, Keisha, and I was like, I feel like you are helping me develop this character. Do, do you want to name her? Um, so it was actually Jessica who, who named her Keisha, um, and it just felt right to do it that way because she had been so involved from the very start of the show. Um, so that was one exception where I just forgot to name someone. <laughs> um, in in It Devours, there's a, there's a lot that happens that explores the tension between the worldviews that faith and science provides. Is that a tension that exists in your lived lives? 
I mean, I, I think both Joseph and I grew up in, in families that both had uh, strong religious histories and, and strong scientific, uh, you know, uh, worked in scientific fields. Uh, and so uh, there was always... Can expand on that? What are you talking yeah, about? Yeah, man? like, uh, okay. so, so like... Um, Joseph's math. Uh, Joseph's mom is a math professor and has been for over two decades. And uh, uh, my father was an engineer for a long, long time. Uh, but also, uh, you know, Joseph grew up going to synagogue. I grew up going to Baptist church, and uh, and so those were those were both big parts of of us growing up. And I, you know, I grew up in a in a world definitely where there was, uh, uh, y- you know, you would stay after Sunday school. And like really, really insane Jack Chick track level stuff of like you would watch slideshows that were like super like pro life, mm-hmm. um, and you would uh, you would pass out tracks to people like you would have people that, at church that were like would uh, like honestly I knew a person who would leave them as a tip at a oh. restaurant. Um, thinking that that's the most valuable thing they could leave someone, and um, you know, there's a there's a level of, of of extremism in 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 the church that I grew up in, but also, uh, but I also went to a lot of other churches growing up that were really beautiful and filled with wonderful people, and so I've always had a fondness for personally. Uh, uh, for the Christian religion and its teachings and all of the things that are there. And, and Joseph and I have had a lot of talks about this too, which is that, um, which is the idea of like, I don't, I've never really felt like they, that like faith and science cannot coexist. Um, obviously they're at odds on their models of the world, but they're both just that models of the world. And there's, there's, uh, there's fallacies in both. And there's, uh, there's definitely people who aren't able to look past their own structure in order to, to try and understand how things work and function. And so I think, I think finding those ways where those two monoliths, you know, basically like clash where they rub up against each other, the friction that's there, I think was something we're, we both have been interested in just in general conversation and then got to deal with it some in this book too. Is there anything that's, that's sensitive enough that you worry about including it? You know, like, do you have a voice in your head that's like, or a red pen that's like, oh, I'm just, Aunt Kathy's going to kill me if I include this. About science and religion or? I think first I ask about science and religion because that is delicate, at least in family context, particularly with some, you know, older relatives and stuff, but also generally, like, is there anything that's just too adult for, you know, not safe for Night Vale? (laughs) (laughs) (sighs) Not really. Uh, I mean, I think it's a matter of how you talk about it. I mean, like, uh, there's a, spoiler, there is a sex scene in this book. It's, brief um and it's um but it's it's i think we've never done that before not i know you've not never directly done that um <laughs> but it was just a matter of how you write it um generally it just doesn't come up because it's mostly from the point of view of a radio show <laughs> and generally on a community radio show you don't uh yeah. you don't talk through your sex life um right but we've definitely <laughs> We definitely also just written stuff that we just realized wasn't right, and I don't mm. think it was because it, w- it wasn't it was too sensitive. Uh, you know, for instance, Jeffrey wrote a, an episode about uh, the character Earl Harlan, um, uh, played by Will Wheaton, and uh, I, I, the first draft um, just started going into a darker and darker place, and it just ended up with this very depressing portrait of someone struggling with depression and alcoholism, mm. and it it kind of cornered itself into this deeply sad place with no way out and so he started over because it (laughs) not because you're trying to avoid talking about those things but it just became this spiral that that you can't get out of and I've definitely had that too um writing uh guest parts for the character Michelle Wynn um I have this tendency every time to make them more sad every time (laughs) and I don't know why that's my impulse with her but just every time her parts get sadder and sadder and I really have to pull out of that nose dive. So when you read the other's work and you know and and if you're reading one of those episodes it just got like really really too dark is is the first response like oh I think this is too dark and the second response like you cool bro do you know what I mean (laughs) like like can you see what's going on in the other person's life by the episode that they just submitted? 
Um, you know, I was like uh, t- specifically for like it was last ge- it was last year's tour. Uh, we wrote a part for Kate Jones who plays Michelle Wynn, and uh, I remember Joseph sending it over to me, and it really was like I remember reading it. And I was like, this ends so sadly. Like she's lost all of her money, and she doesn't <laughs> know why she made the choices she made, and like it really is was. Uh, and so, but it was a thing where I was like, rather than like I don't know, I think the thing that both of us try, which is not to. You know, if, if something looks like you're going to completely dismantle what somebody was trying to do, then you pass it back to them. You, you know, we've done that before you pass it back to somebody and be like, I think what you're going for is here, but I, I'm worried that this doesn't land and then this doesn't. Do you want to give it a second go? But for something like that, I knew what Joseph was trying to do, and it was a thing where, you know, you have that moment where you're like, but listen, here's the thing. Uh, the thing about Michelle is, is that, like, she's really, like, the thing is, is that she really is uh, in, she's really in touch with her own solitude. Mm-hmm. And so you kind of turn it around and you try and find ways to make somebody who feels like, I don't need money, I don't need all of these things, I reject all of this and I'm very happy with myself. And so you played that and, and it, you know, there was more to it than that and added some jokes or whatever, but it, it ended up being great and Kate and Cecil did an awesome job with it. So a lot of times you just kind of look at what somebody is going for and you see like, if it tilts too far one way, maybe you try and bring mm-hmm. it back. Um, and I think I left a note being like, hey, I switched this over, I'd let me know if I move that too far. Sure. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, that's a really great example of, of the safety net of collaboration in that I knew that part wasn't right when I sent it to him. I think I even had a note about that. I'm like, I, this got really sad and I, I couldn't really find my way out um and but it is the safety net of just like uh jeffrey will find find the way find the, the the right answer here or if not he'll have some suggestions that'll help me find it like there's that you can just kind of toss out something you know isn't right yet in 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 the personal stories that are lived in the podcast and the novels um you know very often to, to, my, to my read anyway it feels like um it feels like a lot of what I'm reading is absurdist satire. Would would do you embrace or reject the word satire for what you do? This looks like a reject. <laughs> and then here, uh, I generally avoid satire because I uh, at least using the term because it. it f- it seems to imply something a little bit different tonally than what we're doing. Sure. Um, can I? Can I? Okay. Yeah. So if I were to say, if I were to say for the moment, let's not use the word, but. When I read passages that make me laugh about um, about sometimes the way that faith and science interact or the way that uh, consumer culture works, et cetera, I'm laughing because that's how the real world works, but you've cranked the amp to 11. Yeah, I think there's definitely elements that, to that. Yeah, I think that's really fair. That? Yeah, I mean, I, th- I think because there, there are elements of satire in what we do. I, and I only said that I avoid using the term just because sometimes uh, when you have a brief moment to describe yeah. what it is you do to somebody, I don't want them to take away Night Vale as a satire. And maybe as a it's whole. my read too. But, okay. um, but I think there are I strong think elements of that in there too, of like where we satire conspiracy theories. We satire, right. we satire the NRA constantly, like from the first episode. <laughs> like it's just... Um, yeah, I don't even know if satire is the right word for there. I think we just straight up make fun of them. Yeah, um, <laughs> yeah. I mean, we just try to make them feel bad because they're bad. Right. <laughs> Am I? And it might be that I'm foisting. Do you guys, by a show of hands, do you guys read any moments of satire in the naps? None. Some. Some. Okay. 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 The Night Vale NRA. The Night Vale NRA. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> So, yeah. We're just gonna list everything about Night Vale <laughs> one by one to the creators and the co- creator and co-writers of Night Vale. I mean, I think it goes back to our core philosophy uh, with the writing of Night Vale that we kind of fall back on when when you're trying to figure out something, which is you just the more absurd something is, the more normal you describe it, and the ah. more everyday mm. something is, the more absurd and scary you try to make it seem so if you have something mundane you really try to break it down to its parts and describe it in a way that'll make someone feel like it's they're an alien reading how humans work like you just you try to alienate them from that mundane thing um and i think sometimes that works as satire and sometimes it just turns into something else i don't know poetry um I like poetry. Can I, did you say I don't like poetry? I said I like poetry. <laughs> All right, we're good. <laughs> <laughs> can I can I invite one of you two to read a section from the new novel? Sure. Yes. <laughs> so 
I very wisely, um, partly because we decided on which section to read literally like five minutes before this, um, did not do a pre-read of this. Um, which, what that means is I will likely hit a word that I will stumble on pretty badly. And I just want you all to be very generous about that. <laughs> and just know that I feel very embarrassed. I'm just, I'm just imagining the whole audience just boo. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, this is chapter three. Nalanjana had no interest in Carlos. In any way, he was married to the local community radio host, Cecil Palmer. Still, she couldn't not notice that he was, in his way, stunningly handsome. Even his frown was perfect, and he ran his hands perfectly through his perfect hair. In science, of course, there is always a lot of pressure to look good. <laughs> Appearances are a major part of a science career, and top scientists face all sorts of accusations of plastic surgery and unhealthy diets, a constant scrutiny in gossip magazines and tabloid blogs. But Carlos stayed out of all of that. He was a beautiful person, but that never interested him, interested him much. He only cared about two things, his scientific work and his family. Nalanjana didn't know Carlos's family well. She knew his teenage niece, Janice, was born with spina bifida, and while her frequent checkups of eyes, kidneys, and spine came back healthy each time, Carlos would take days off work to be with her and his brother and sister-in-law. Nalanjana knew that his husband, Cecil sometimes faced serious dangers as a reporter in a town as full of terrible secrets as Night Vale, and those dangers sent Carlos into a worried stupor. He would pace about the office, trying not to call the station to ask if Cecil was okay. Not much got done in the lab when Carlos fretted for Cecil's safety. She could tell when Carlos had a date night planned because he put gel in his hair and wore his most striking lab coat. <laughs> she was uncertain why Carlos wanted to talk to her now, she hoped that the problem was with his scientific work. She didn't have much to say on the subject of being in love. Not that she hadn't had boyfriends. She was a human being of adult age with an interest in other human beings, and she had been in relationships starting from high school, but she did not feel qualified to offer advice on the subject. She was just stumbling along, the same as anyone. It was occasionally fun and often lonely, whether she was with someone at the time or not. Carlos interrupted this reverie by pulling down a chart that said in large letters, Science. <laughs> Today's topic of discussion is science. I've provided a visual aid. <laughs> oh, thank God. He gestured for her to sit, but she didn't like sitting much, and so she gestured that she would rather stand, and there was some gesturing back and forth that neither of them understood. Finally, Carlos sat, and she remained standing. I know you are aware of the house, he began. The general concept of houses? No, uh, sorry, the house that doesn't exist. He pulled down another chart. It had a picture of a house on it. Yes, she said, I know that house. It doesn't exist. I mean, it, it looks like it exists. Like it's right there when you look at it and it's between two other identical houses, so it would make more sense for, there to, for it to be there than not, but it doesn't actually exist, he finished. Right, it's a weird house. Or it isn't a weird house. It's weird, but not a house. It's hard to know how to talk about it. Everyone in town knew about the house that looks like it exists, but doesn't. There was a common dare among scientists to knock on the door and then run away. <laughs> Carlos himself had once entered the house. He didn't talk much about this. Anytime the topic came up, he would wave it off or try to change the subject. What Nalanjana had learned from his research notes was that its interior was entirely different from that of the common prefab house it seemed to be when one peered through its windows. Seen from the inside, the house contained no furniture and no decorations, except a small black and white photo of a lighthouse. The house was not a house, but an entryway to a desert otherworld, vast and empty. There was a single mountain in that otherworld, and it was completely believable to all who saw it. At the top of the mountain was the lighthouse from the photo. There had been a cold light emanating from all around, though the sun was never visible. Hypothesis. The desert otherworld had been cold and empty and had made Carlos feel lost to the people he loved. Carlos cared more than anything about the people he loved, and so a place with no one and nothing in it had been traumatizing for him. Ever since Carlos's return from the otherworld, a few years back, everyone in the lab knew he had been obsessed with the house, and like most obsessions with the truth, this had made the city council nervous. Your job is being a scientist, the council had told him via an empty-eyed child messenger who had helpfully lunged out at him from the shower when he'd gotten up to pee in the middle of the night. 
So look pretty and write papers. Don't go searching around for the truth. You're a scientist, not a snoop. <laughs> Man, said Nalanjana, as he told her about the message from the council. Yes, it was upsetting, said Carlos. And then, of course, I was stuck with an empty-eyed child messenger, and you know how long it takes the city council to come back around and pick them up. We ended up having to give her rides to school for the next three weeks. We're going to her eighth grade graduation tomorrow. <laughs> oh, cute. Super cute, he said. But I won't let the city council dissuade me from preve uh, preventing anyone else from being hurt by that other world. They've been trying to stop me. I more or less got through that. <laughs> Very good. All right. I think we've got time for some questions from the audience now, if people want to. Yeah. Should we do hands up? And then we've got a microphone that we're going to. Yeah, perfect. Would you want to be? I'm going to give you. Be drunk on power. I'm going to give you. <laughs> I deputize thee to, to select the question askers. Your episodes occasionally contain bits written in Russian. Is there any particular reason you chose Russian? I don't know why we did that originally, other than, <laughs> other than it was another thing to have there. Um, uh, so part of it is just that, like, uh, our friend Daniel Mirsky uh, is fluent in Russian and helped us write those things and 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 teach Cecil to pronounce them and things like that. So that was part of it. I mean, I think there's there's the other element where with with Night Vale of kind of continuing on. There there's some other stuff that we've developed over time from the. Uh, some key moments in Nightville's history that happened in the early 80s, and, and it seems to be this connection of the Cold War. Um, and so I think it's always sort of tied into something with that. I mean, there's there's nothing specific that we've developed there as to specifically why, but I think it's just in the back of my head. I'm always thinking about that. I grew up in the Cold War, and so the idea of like a Russian submarine showing up in the desert and people speaking Russian suddenly and strangely, I, I just, I don't know, seems sort of cool. <laughs> When just you, um, picturing that ancient past when there was weird conspiracy theories about Russia. <laughs> 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 when you said that there's nothing specific that we're developing there, I thought you meant in Russia. <laughs> no, no. We are. We're building a night veil in Russia. It's a theme park. Also, thank you for Sam. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Okay, in the blue, in the blue, dibbles of the blue, dibbles of the blue, pass the mic, thank you. Everyone's like looking at their shirts like semantically, this could be blue. Well, I'm like full body You win blue, blue oh, though. You yeah. unequivocally. Uh, thank you. So I was really curious, so the podcast obviously comes from a really singular voice, not just in terms of your writing style, but Cecil's voice. So how did you adapt the Night Vale voice once you weren't just embodying one character? Yeah, that's an interesting question. I mean, in one way, the, the voice we use on the show is Cecil, the character. But it's also, in another way, that shared voice we talked about, the one that is kind of Night Vale. Um, and so I do think we write the novels with that tone, even though it's not the character talking anymore. Um, you know, a lot of it more is thinking about the goal of what we're writing, where it's going to go. You know, a podcast, I think you have to think a lot about how it sounds. Um, so with that, all I, I with my with an episode of a podcast, I will literally act it out loud to myself like two or three times to really just try and get a sense of any time it gets stuck. Uh, when you're writing a live show, we you know when we do a, a live night show, you always have to think about where the audience energy is and where you want it to go. So that's that's kind of where you're thinking. And with a novel you're just constantly thinking about the visual pattern, the visual rhythm. You can do a lot longer sentences than you can with voice actors, um, because if you do a long sentence for a voice actor, then they probably will get lost somewhere in there. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it, I don't know. It, it really, there is definitely a lot of overlap between the third person omniscient narration of the book and Cecil's voice, um, but that's just because a lot of that is just how we write that world. Thank you. A question from over here in the ash-colored bias zip double button, and wow. that was a really that was a really <laughs> that was a really good question. You consider consider moderation. I wish I thought of that. Yeah, it's actually freezing in my apartment. That's why I'm working. <laughs> on. Um, so I like started listening to the podcast pretty late, so I was like catching up on things, and then I think this was sometime last year after the election. But there was an episode that I was listening to that was an old episode and was basically what was happening like right now. 
So like some, <laughs> there are some episodes that like I listened to and I was like, you guys essentially predicted the future, which is kind of a really scary thing. But what's your, what's your reaction when like you see something happening today and you're like, we wrote about that in our podcast? It's really, it's really weird. Like uh, a friend pointed out, and I'd forgotten this storyline. But when the, uh, when we were having the big news stories uh, going around about taking down Confederate statues, a friend of mine had been, po- had been like popping in like r- really old episodes of Night Vale, and he was like, I heard one where you had a thing about a character because we had the character in the first season uh, who. Uh, was the super racist guy who dressed up, the super racist white guy who dressed up as a Native American, and he ends up doing a heroic act, so the town of Nightvale builds a statue in his honor, but then buries it in the desert because they don't want any statues of racists in their town. <laughs> and it was, uh, it, it, it's a really, it's really, so like in a story like that, it's sort of funny to think back of like how that ties into that. But it's a little depressing because I feel like just the natural idea of like, yeah, no no statues of racists is a pretty like basic <laughs> m- moral stance. Like there's not really two low sides bar. to the, yeah. And I, and I feel like, it, so it's always sort of sad when it pops up in the news that you're like, wow, we're having this debate. This is crazy. Um, you know, it definitely affects us in the sense of like, I don't want to make, uh, we don't want to make tyranny cute, right? Like, I don't want to, like, make that uh, adorable. One of the things that... Um, I think there's a moment in one of the Night Vale episodes where we have Pamela Winchell, who's the director of emergency press conferences for the city of Night Vale, and when she calls press conferences, she says the craziest stuff. And um, I think there is a moment where she actually literally, like, like ducks behind a tree and like Sean Spicer literally (laughs) hid behind a bush one time and I'm like you ruined one of my favorite characters to write for you asshole and it makes it so much harder to write some of that stuff now yeah it's definitely top of mind because so much of the news and and the people in it uh, I I use the word people loosely um, uh, make it really like really difficult to uh, yeah to to make this funny. (laughs) Let's do it right next to you. Yeah, there. Red. Yes. Hello? Yeah. Hiya. Oh, okay. I'm not hearing my own voice. Uh, Okay. Yeah. When you started this series, I I always came off as two guys who just decided to do something, and it just kept going. I was wondering, uh, did you start out with, like, a, a a series Bible, or did you just write it as you went along uh the the second one absolutely i mean we it, it was just uh the two of us just trying something you know uh i i, I wanted I, I just started writing these paragraphs from this desert town i didn't even know what it was yet they were just these loose paragraphs the very first one i ever wrote was the one about the lights above the arby's i just wrote this weird paragraph about lights above the arby's and i'm like okay this is something Let's keep writing it. Um, and then once uh, Jeffrey came on board and we started working out characters and plots and, and making episodes, it really was at first just kind of trying stuff. But we did have the rule very early on in our first meeting about it. Uh, we were like, we can go as weird as we want, but we need to keep strict continuity. Everything that happens has to matter and stick around um, because it doesn't matter how weird you go then, it starts to gain its own truth. It starts to feel like a world. Um, and so a lot of the storytelling we do is, is just building on, on what we have. I'll do a lot of, uh, you know, I'm, I'm writing a three-part um, epi- a series of episodes right now where I, gen- I genuinely just went back through this. I had this long list of characters and places and things in Night Vale I wanted to write about that I just, I, I've been, I had been gradually making this list of things I eventually want to get back to. And I just more or less randomly chose five of them. It was like two characters a place in Night Vale and then a thing in Night Vale. And I had that list and I'm like, okay, I need to make a story on this. And then I built out a story um, based on those things that I think actually came together really well and feels like it grew out of what we had done before. But a lot of it was just building on the history we had, we had already established. The episode, uh, what is it? The story of you, you know, the one where Cecil's talking. That's got to be one of the most terrifying podcasts I've ever listened to in my life. I don't know why, but it just freaks me out. Here. Thank you. Awesome. <laughs> uh, here in the Heather Gray with black accents on sleeve and collar. Nicely done. 
Um, two things. One, I tried to look this up before I came here so I would know to ask you guys. I can't find a single ginger in the Night Vale characters. Oh, this is, there's, there's a... There's yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we don't really physically describe anyone, so... Yeah. yeah. I mean... He's so beautiful. Yeah, I mean, even with yeah. Carlos... Even with Carlos, we've never given a top to bottom, like, right. here's what Carlos looks like. So it's there might details. be gingers. Absolutely. Um, I, I would say I would say there definitely are. I just uh, would just say I'm that there's no... I'm going to picture everyone in Night Vale as a ginger now, thank you. <laughs> Great. <laughs> I believe in your truth. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the second thing is, how did you come up with the idea of the glow cloud all hail? All hail. Um... <laughs> I think Joseph wrote that out and early on when we when we first started like I would say for the first like probably like 10 to 12 episodes uh the way we wrote them was we had a basically like a document I think just called rough material or something like that and it was just essentially if you had a uh hey if you have a community calendar item or a, a traffic report or just some little story you're working on just throw that in there and we just the idea was like keep that document populated with a bunch of little stories and then when it is according to the calendar when it's your turn to put together an episode you just go and pull copy and paste out of that and build a full story and you may need to like flesh out this certain thing and so uh yeah so one of the storylines that 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 Joseph put in there early was a glow cloud um, storyline. And I think you, yeah, you did episodes one and two and I did three and four, I think to start off something like that. But anyways, it was a, yeah, that was in there. And so we just kind of copied and pasted and then just filled it out through editing, I think. And then over time we just kept going back to glow cloud as a, as a character. That's really it. Like, let's make him uh, head of the PTA. Yeah. Yeah. I don't, I never PTA, have any the school board. I never have any satisfying answer to like the origin of ideas. I, I just, I write stuff and sometimes it works. <laughs> and let's do a question here by the pillar with painted nails, library glasses, and two pieces of flair, left shoulder. In the meantime, <laughs> do, you guys, do you guys still keep that document? Uh, do you guys still have that shared document with this yeah, kind of scrap Yeah, actually material? we do. Yeah. I mean, because we, we like uh, cut like control X stuff from there as we, we worked on it. So the stuff that's left is just kind of mostly stuff we didn't use. So it's kind of this fascinating document of actually like just bits that never worked yeah. um, over the course of five years. <laughs> or some of it was like, you would have like a 2,800 word episode and you're like, we really need about 2,500 words. And so you'd be like, here's two giant paragraphs that are just kind of Homeless. peripheral jokes to the story. <laughs> so you just copy paste them there. So. It's really interesting and great that you brought up um, this idea of keeping continuity because um, I at least noticed that like the fifth anniversary was sort of this weird soft reset of the world. Like everything was true and then suddenly everything wasn't true and then suddenly everything was true again. Um, I, I, it, cause it made me w really wonder there near, you know, leading up to that moment, are they finishing Night Vale? Is it done? Or, I mean, this would be a great time to end it because look at all of this stuff happening, but also, okay, hunt a car, cool, great, awesome, whatever. Um, so when will you know if and when Night Vale is over? I mean, I, I mean, I, I sort of like, it was interesting, like a lot of people had that response to episode 109 or whatever, like a story about hunt a car because they, they, there was a lot of uh, explaining of what Night Vale is and why it's weird or whatever. But it, you know, it's funny. Like uh, it, that would have been a terrible moment to end it because I'm enjoying making it. Like so, it's like uh, this is the worst time to end it when I'm having a lot of fun doing it. You want to end it when you're miserable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm waiting to be super sad every day. <laughs> and, um, um, no, I mean we're having a blast doing it. And and the thing is, is that from the beginning to the point of to Joseph's point of like having strict continuity, it's not just a matter of being consistent with your storytelling. It's a matter of like having a story of this town that can just kind of go on and on and on ad infinitum, like a radio show would. Um, and you know, radio shows get canceled. This one technically wouldn't because it's independently owned by us. But. Um, <laughs> But the thing is, is that, yeah, our hope was that it, it's really just about the story of the town as it moves forward. It, it, we've never tried a, an approach to of like what Lost wanted to do or what like The Leftovers was doing or a show like that, that it's like sets up with, hey, episode one, here's this crazy mystery. Uh, 
episode X, whatever the last episode is, here are all your answers. Everyone's happy. And I just, I, our show has never been about answers. It's just been about these characters that live there. And so to have an episode like a story about Hunter Car, we debated about it a little bit to say like, should we like have all of this information out for the fans? Like are people gonna feel like, wow, they answered everything. But our, our idea was not answering anything. It was a matter of like, it was something that the people in town needed to hear. And it was something Cecil needed to hear, and whether he heard it fully or not, I don't know. But I, I, I think in general, it was something that the characters needed to hear from that character. And so that's why we wrote that, but it was never about, we've never been about like, hey, the hooded figures, let's give you a full bio on them. Maybe we will one day if we get super interested in it, but it's kind of fun not knowing. Hmm. All right, I think we've got time for two more. Let's do in the back with the maroon. I can't read it. Oh, time to go to the ophthalmologist. I think it says Ophelia University, but that's not a school. <laughs> <laughs> Oberlin is not far off. So, okay, okay. Um, something that I see almost like a lot of interviewers ask you all is, would you like to live in Night Vale? Which is a very perplexing question to me, and it seems to be to you all as well, because why would you want to ever do that? Why do you think people think that is something you want, and why do you think somebody might want to live there? I mean, I do think, I think it's kind of just a maybe, probably it's just a standard question with any writers that have created a fictional world. People are always like, do you want to live there? Um, <laughs> and I think the answer is almost always no, because, <laughs> because interesting stories are happening there, and interesting stories are dangerous. <laughs> uh, you don't want to be anywhere near an interesting story. Um, <laughs> as for why someone would want to live there, I don't know. Um, I mean, I, it is an interesting place. Um, it's a place that has different values than our own, and some of those values are much better. Um, they seem to be much more accepting of people. And some of those values are much worse. They seem to have um, spy cameras all over everyone's houses. <laughs> Uh, so I guess it, it would be a bargain that maybe you would have to make with yourself that this seems that my imminent death by a thing in my closet as a vague yet menacing agency watches me through a spy camera is just worth um, living in this town that, that seems uh, like a nice place to live sometimes. <laughs> okay, and last one will go far all the way to the edge here. Yep. Oh, hang tight, hang tight, hang tight. It's so close. Three, two, one. You're live. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> my question was: You've talked about representation a lot of um, a lot of different ways, but one thing that hasn't really been addressed so much in the show is mental and physical illness and disability. Um, do you guys have plans for addressing that in the future? Because I know you don't often describe people's like what they look like, and you don't like you're narrated from Cecil, so you don't necessarily know what goes on in people's heads, but like as someone who sees a lot of aspects of myself in the show and mm -hmm. is really excited by that, I'd love to see more parts of myself. Yeah, I mean, I think, I, think, I think a lot of the limitation of the podcast itself is that it comes strictly from Cecil's uh, narration. And so, but uh, yeah, I mean, I think there's a lot of areas that we're interested in, in exploring and figuring out how to fully flesh those out as, as real real characters and a lot of times there might be a thought of that there there may be uh there may be uh physical or 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 mental health issues that a character is dealing with but may not be necessarily um uh, part of a specific story that that, we, that I can put in there without it feeling like a, a sidebar thing, like something that I want to know more about and talk more about. So I think it's always something I'm uh, speaking for myself that I'm I'm personally interested in in handling those things, um, but it's just finding the right way and time to do that for that. Um, you know, it's it's something where we we hit on it here and there of uh, in this you know in this novel like in that passage we were just talking about of of Janice's uh, physical disability and um, how she deals with it and and uh, you know that sort of thing and 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 trying to give her her own agency in in a couple of recent episodes also dealing with that too of not just being that physical illnesses or physical disabilities are about uh, how it affects everyone else but like how the person who has that disability is uh, has their own agency and their own wants and desires as a character. So I think it's just building it up in that way and finding ways to place that that doesn't um, 
doesn't shortchange that, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Uh, also, I'm just slow at getting the things too sometimes. Well, I was just gonna say, I mean, that's been kind of one of the good things for me about um, Alice Isn't Dead, um, because I'm now with that I'm writing from a different narrator. And so uh, I have um, severe, sometimes crippling anxiety. Um, and with Keisha, with that narrator, I been able to explore my experience of that through her voice um, because um, she does too now because I made her have it. <laughs> B before we give you our final thanks, um, can I just ask both of you in brief, what would be the best thing that a fan can do this week or tonight to help make this novel a success? Um, oh, I don't know. Uh, uh, would li like it and tell people about it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah do I, that. Ho hopefully enjoy the book, and if you do, uh, tell folks about it. Yeah. Hey, will you help me thank Joseph and Jeffrey for their evening? And thank you, Dessa. Thanks, Dessa. It's a beautiful novel.